we are in the book of Romans. And today we're talking about sex, gender, and sexuality. There you go. Stuff none of us want to talk about. I'm just saying. All right. I'm, this is why we go through books of the Bible, right? Because you're like, what do you do? Just randomly try to pick out the most controversial passages so that we can just all be offended every week. And it isn't really that way. I'm just saying. I just like I'm just going through the Bible. As we do through the Bible, go through a New Testament. Through an Old Testament. So we happen to fall upon the most controversial, most hated, despised, rejected, and attacked text in the Bible today. There you go. So this is going to, we'll see how this goes. But uh, just kind of to set the stage for Romans 1, and you can be turning there, we'll be in Romans 1, starting verse 18 through the end of Romans 1. But when, when an in culture, everything blows up, and everyone gets in an uproar, and everyone uh, has this major shift or this dramatic changes, and everyone jumps on the emotional bandwagon, and as one put it, kind of joins into the Congo line to hell, we need to step back and say, wait a minute. We need to compare everything we're seeing and everything we're feeling back to the Word of God. Because the Word of God is the true reality. The Word of God is from God, from God directly. It's revelation from God, God revealing what's true about this universe that he made. It's God revealing what's true about himself. So it's not speculation, it's revelation. We're not speculating, we're not saying, I hope God's like this, I feel God's like that. We're saying, God said he's like this. And so we need to go back to that. Because later in this study of Romans, we're going to come across Romans 12, and he says this, I just want to Jump ahead for just a second. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So if you think, hey, I sang, so I did worship, singing is part of worship. But everything you do in life is worship. Everything you do in life has a spiritual element. So everything in your life and in my life has a spiritual component, and it's worship, either worship directed at Jesus or worship directed at self. But he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so you may prove what the will of God is. That was good, acceptable, and perfect. So here's what the world's out to do, right? The world has a mold, and it's trying to put you into that mold. And the idea of a mold is, if you have a mold and you're trying to mold jelly, jello or something like that, the idea is that everything comes out what? Everything comes out the same. Romans 12 says, the world has a mold it's trying to shape you into. And its goal is that everyone comes out the same. Hmm. And our culture has a mold that they want to form you into. That's true from the right or the left. They have a mold they want to form you into. Okay? And yet Christianity is, as one put it, the last great rebellion. We're the last great holdup. We rebel against the molds that the culture, through social media, through politicians, through universities, through all of these things, we reject the mold that they are trying to put us into. Because we have already come to agree that Jesus is right, and we're going to follow Jesus, and what he says is true, and what he tells us is reality, no matter what we feel, or even see. That's Christianity, by the way. It's believing that Jesus is the ultimate reality, and that what he said is ultimately what goes. That's faith. Hmm. But the world is trying to mold you, and it's going to take hard work for you not to end up molded like this world. It's going to take hard work. And so, the temptation is that Christians want to end up thinking and doing what everyone else is thinking and doing, which is a sort of a, a Christian spin on it, but Romans 12 tells us that we're not to be conformed, we're not to be put into that mold, we transform by the renewing of mind so we can test the fruit with what God is. That's what we want to know, right? What does God think? What is God, how does God see it? What does God feel about it? The Bible says that through the Spirit of God, we can know how God thinks and feels and how he sees things. 
And so today's text on sex, gender, and sexuality, which I, I get it, none of us want to talk about, it's something that God brings, and he brings truth and reality to. And just again, for a quick context, if you are younger than me, I'm 48, if you're younger than me, the only thing you've ever known is a culture that is coming out of the hippie culture of sex, and drugs, and all of this garbage, right? And which led to Roe v. Wade, so that we wanted to do away with any responsibility or accountability. We want to be able to get rid of the kids when they get in the way. We just want to have sex can be anything and with anyone. And this is the culture, this is the only classroom you've ever known if you're younger than me. Because that was 1970, the hippie revolution that really we're feeling in its full orb effects in culture today. But it really leads us to the question this passage deals with today, but does anyone have the right outside of me to tell me what I can or cannot do with my sexuality or body? Does that sound like something our culture would talk about? Does anybody have the right outside of me to have say anything about my sexuality or my body? You ever hear that type of thing? No. The passage today says yes. Jesus does. Yes, Jesus does. So we're going to look at that. If you remember, we're in the book of Romans. We move from talking about the social upheaval in this culture and all of that into the book of Romans because the book of Romans, what philosophers and theologians have said, and we, we began a couple weeks ago by reading a number of their statements, that the Western civilization was largely based off the book of Romans. Theologians over time, and said, as one put it well, that Romans is the most important book in the most important book. The great church father, Chrysostom, would have somebody read the book of Romans three or four times a week to him. The book of Romans is so insightful, not only theologically to understand the gospel, which it really speaks to the gospel, but to even understand culture and to understand what God views and how God views the culture and how it should be put together. So we saw the first one week, Paul was a servant to a God who served him. Which you and I are servants to a God who served us as well, right? And then secondly, we looked at Paul was eager to share the gospel in Rome. And you think, wow, he's eager to share the gospel in Rome. He had been smuggled out of Berea on the threat of death. He had been beaten in Philippi. In fact, every town that he had gone to and presented the gospel, he got beaten or stoned or thrown out or had to flee for his life. So what does he think of the next town? It's Rome. Woo! I can't wait. I'm so eager to share the gospel. That's super convicting, by the way. For me, all this last two weeks, I've been like, am I eager right now? Am I eager to tell somebody of the, what we said, the Greek word dunamis, where we get the word dynamite, the power of God. What is the power of God? The gospel that saves. The gospel that can give you eternal life. The gospel that will change everything about your life and give you the Holy Spirit and erase all your sin and trespasses and guilt and shame and, and, and remove all condemnation so that you're right with God and you'll be with him forever. That's what the gospel, the power of God is. So he says, I'm eager to share that. And so then he goes right from that and makes a very smooth transition. Here we go, verse 18. For the wrath of God, oh, that's always a smooth transition, right? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So he goes into, what we're going to go into, is God's airtight case against humanity. God's airtight case against all humanity. And he's going to start with what we call paganism, just, just raw unbelievers in society, the things they do, the way they see it, all their belief systems, and he's going to start by making an airtight case against them. But what we'll see in chapter 2 next time is that he then, the, the religious, moralistic, religious writer, looking at it going, yeah, get him. And then God turns and says, you're every bit as much under my condemnation. And here's why. So we'll see that next time. So this is I, able opportunity offender, right? You're saying, before this is done, before you chapter 3, if you're not offended, you're not listening. Just saying, all right? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Feel like, I don't even believe that God could have wrath. You have wrath. Republicans have wrath. Democrats have wrath. People have wrath all the time. You don't think God could have wrath? 
Why do we have wrath? When things don't don't go the way we think they should, when they don't turn out the way they should, we get angry. A lot of times people think that it's legit for them to get angry, but not legit for God to get angry. God made the place. Why does God get angry? He gets angry because things are wrong and broken, and he sees it perfectly. So yes, we feel wrath, but God feels wrath. Because he loves mankind so much that he gets very upset and very angry at that which distorts and destroys and harms what he loves, which is mankind. Hmm. We'll see in a minute the evidences of God's wrath. Because a lot of times you're like, man, if the country keeps going this direction, we're going to feel the wrath of God. The passage today does not say that. Romans 1 says we're currently feeling the wrath of God. I want to make that point here in a minute. But he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. This, this, I want to first deal with the suppression of truth. This is a key concept. It's a suppression of truth. It's like they take God's truth and, and, and so they put it in a headlock, right? And, and then they put it underwater. They're just trying to drown God's truth, right? I want nothing to do with truth, right? I want to get it out of the way. I want to kill it. I want to remove its power. I don't want truth. From God's perspective, that's our culture. We hate truth. We're suppressing truth. We want to rob truth of its power. We want to destroy truth. It's not that God hasn't spoken, it's that we're not listening and we don't want to obey, right? But the problem is, when we decide, I don't want your truth, God, I don't want anything to do with it, I'm going to suppress it, I'm going to cover it over, I'm going to turn a deaf ear to it, I'm going to drown it, I'm going to do whatever I can to do away with truth, we're ultimately not dealing with reality. And you can look at our culture, and as we deny truth, we're not dealing with reality, right? Look at the nuttiness in our culture, and you can see that we're not dealing with reality. Transgender, right, men are now clobbering women across the country in sports. And that's called justice. That's just weird. You would think even if you were a feminist who didn't believe in Christ, you would be upset by that one. That's just stupid. How do you how do you get there? You just disconnect from reality, right? When you disconnect from truth, you disconnect from reality. We decide that we what haven't had enough crime, so we're going to defund police. You know how do you disconnect from reality? You disconnect from reality when you disconnect from truth. What does God say about people's hearts? It's just human hearts are instinctively wrong and sinful. That's what the Bible says. We live in a culture that says human hearts are instinctively good and righteous. So God says if they're instinctively sinful, then you would have to use punishment in order to produce a good and right and just society. Take children, right? We got plenty of them around here. Let them have their own way, and what happens? Wonderful kids, right? Wow, your life is so terrible, it's like, oh, I resign, I quit, I'm moving. You're like, you can't, you're the mom, right? It doesn't work that way, right? It, it doesn't go well, right? You've got to bring correction because your child didn't come from the womb loving righteousness and goodness and knowing God. They came out, from what the Bible says, sinful, all the way back to Psalm 51, right? From my mother's womb, I went straight from my mother's womb, I was sinful, King David said. The idea is that we have to train them. You know, I never trained, I have six kids, right? I've never trained one to throw a fit, and every one of them figured it out. Right? I never taught a one of them to cry to get their way. And every one of them figured it out. Unbelievable, huh? This is just unbelievable. But the reality is, I never taught them how to be selfish, and every single one of them figured it out way before I ever thought they could, they could possibly, right? How did that happen? Maybe the Bible is right, and man is instinctively sinful ever since the fall, right? Huh, that makes sense. Hmm. 
But we live in a day that says truth is not because we've suppressed true truth, right? Real reality. And then we make up our own truth. So I say, man, I am a young Vietnamese woman. And everyone gets mad. You're not young, you're not Vietnamese. Okay, I'll give you a woman. Right? Okay, we can, we can deal with that. You can, you can be a woman if you want. Hey, truth is its own thing. No, I'm not young, I'm not Vietnamese, and I'm not a woman. And if I said I was, I wouldn't be dealing with reality. But we live in a day where we like to suppress truth. God says, in his building a case against all humanity, he starts with what we call pagan culture. He says, they suppress the truth and their unrighteousness. They block it, they hinder it, they kill it, they just try to hold it underwater until it's just obliterated so they don't have to listen or obey truth. The truth is the only reality. Hmm. But suppression of truth is ultimately, I acknowledge no authority outside myself. So that's what suppression of truth is. I acknowledge no authority outside of me. That's our culture, isn't it? In fact, with that suppression of truth, they go, I read the Bible. I disagree with it. Therefore, I know I'm right. You're like, you came to the wrong conclusion. You read the Bible, you disagreed with it, therefore you're wrong is the right conclusion, right? Not, I read the Bible, I disagree with it, the book's wrong. The book's right. We only agree that the book's wrong when we suppress the truth. The truth does not originate from me, and it doesn't originate from you. We like to say truth originates from me because then nothing and nobody can judge or rule over me. God says, I am the one who gives truth and I judge and rule over you. Hmm. And ultimately, this goes back to this equation as well. What is America's favorite pastime? It's not baseball anymore. It's victimhood. Right? I'm going to be a victim. This is my favorite pastime. You know what? The Bible does not portray us as victims. It portrays us as villains. That's a problem, isn't it? Because, like, if I'm not the victim, then instead of me proclaiming my own goodness, I'm the villain, and God's proclaiming my badness, I would need to flee to him in repentance and seek forgiveness rather than him fleeing to me in repentance, seeking my forgiveness. Because that's what our culture does. It's got a backwards gospel, right? where God is wrong, and he should come and seek my forgiveness, and he should repent. The Bible is saying, I'm not the victim, I'm the villain. He is the victim. I need to go seek his forgiveness for wronging him. That's a way different view, isn't it? The idea, he says, of all ungodliness and unrighteousness means that there are things, ideas, attitudes, and actions that are not acceptable to God. They violate his code of what's right and wrong, and it put us in the category of villains, right? This attitude of victimhood means that I have no moral obligation and nothing is my fault. The Bible is trying to build an archetype case that I have complete responsibility before God and I'm a villain for many more things than I've ever dreamt of. In fact, Listen to this. He says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Woven into the DNA of every person is a knowledge that there is a God. So, you know, I've, I've talked to atheists before. Yeah, I can remember being out front of the AMC over here at Willowbrook and going, this guy's like, I've never believed in God. And I stupidly said, because the Bible says, don't argue with the fool, right? Uh, oh, yeah. There was a time when you believed in God. Well, I set him off, man. I should just get my mouth shut. But the reality is, that is true. There was a time where he knew about God and knew that there was a God. Because why? Because God's already told us. He says he wove it into their DNA. For since the creation of the world, verse 20 of chapter 1 of Romans, the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that we are without excuse. Not only are we without excuse for those sins that we do, we're even without excuse for not dealing with what's woven into our DNA that we know there's a God and we should submit to him. And we should give thanks to him even though we don't even know him fully at that point. Because this is what called 
general revelation. Does anyone know what general revelation is? Dave, I'm going to wake him up right here. Boom. It's uh, revelation that anybody can get. It's not specific. Revelation that anybody can get. This is specific revelation. In the Bible, it's specific about God, and only some get it, right? General revelation is what you see out there, right? It's kind of like the way the master often does. You see a painting, you know there's a painter. You see a building, you know there's a builder. You see creation, you instinctively know there's a creator. That's how it works. That's how it works, God says. And he says we're accountable to that knowledge that he wove into the DNA of every single person. And so you say, man, if God is holding me accountable at that level, I'm in deep trouble. That's his whole point, by the way, of Romans 1, 2, and 3. All people are in deep trouble. And, and, unless we, in chapter 1, look at, and we're going to deal with some sins that are very common in our culture, and it would be easy for us to look at it and go, oh, that's so wrong. God turns right around and says, no. You moralists, that's just as wrong. He nails everybody. Mm. For even though they knew God instinctively, it was wired into their DNA that there's a God. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculation. Their foolish heart was darkened. Now, there are really two forms of general revelation. There's creation, external. Does anyone know what the other form of general revelation that comes up in the next chapter, chapter 2? It's internal. What is that? Conscience. What is that? Conscience. The conscience. So general revelation has two forms. What you see and internally your conscience. Those are the two forms of general revelation. Everybody has them. You go to the jungle Amazon and, and you go and happen upon a tribe that's never, ever, ever been outside of that Amazon basin for thousands of years. They still know those two things. They have general revelation by creation. They have general revelation by conscience. Chapter 2, Romans, is about conscience. Chapter 1 is about the external and creation, right? But he says, uh, these people, he says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculation. Their foolish heart was darkened. Hey, wait a minute. Professing to be wise, they became fools. In verse 23, in exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So you say, wait a minute. These people, many of which are very smart, became very foolish. How did they become very foolish? Suppression of what? Truth. You know, if you listen to news, politicians, or certainly university professors, you will hear very intelligent people who are very foolish. Why? You know college does not teach wisdom. It only gives you information, right? But it might be argued that people who come out of college are more foolish than when they went in. Why? Because the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Many times people come out of university going, Wow, I have even more understanding that there is no God. You're like, wow, you've plummeted even deeper into your foolishness, right? It's just foolish. There's no wisdom there. But what happens is, we have a society that rejects and suppresses, suppresses truth, rejects God, and then turns around and says, hey, things aren't right, things are unjust, things are corrupt, we're going to make it right. You go, whoa, <laughs> that's total hypocrisy. That's not even consistent with your worldview. Because once you have removed God and his moral standard from your worldview, what are you left with? Darwinian evolution that led to Karl Marx removing God from all things political. And you say, wait a minute, that's not even consistent with your worldview. For a Christian, for us to claim injustice is consistent with our worldview, isn't it? Because we go from the Word through our conscience to our Maker, right? We say, that is inconsistent with what the Bible reveals about our Maker. Therefore, that is unjust, and we petition through our conscience that's trained on the Word of God, our Creator, right? Consistent with our worldview. For secular humanists who deny and suppress truth, then they rip off things from our worldview and say, hey, kindness and justice, and that doesn't even fit your worldview. 
This is total hypocrisy. The God who made us set a moral standard. It's when we violate the moral standard that is the definition of injustice. And we are for justice because we are for God and what makes men prosper and flourish. Only our Creator knows how to make men prosper and flourish. And only as we listen to Him can we even understand justice and how to help people prosper and flourish. Hmm. So he says, they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God to the image of the form of corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You go, man, we're not in some third world country where people are worshiping at some little altar. We don't worship animals anymore. We don't build stadiums to the cardinals and the bears. And Why do we use all these four-footed animals and creatures and build big stadiums and worship at our sports arenas? That seems strange, doesn't it? You see, what he's saying is we all worship them. Everything you did yesterday, Saturday, was worship. It was either worship pointed at Jesus or worship pointed somewhere else. It was worship. You worshiped yesterday. Every physical thing you're doing has a spiritual component of either worship of God or worship of something else. Worship of self. Hmm. So he says, so how does God respond to that? He says this. Therefore, God gave them over. By the way, he says that three times in this in these next few verses, gave them over. Therefore God gave them over the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Verse 24. This goes back to the wrath that God is revealed. So we're not saying, man, if our country doesn't do something pretty soon, we could end up in a big mess and the wrath of God can come. That's not true. What he's going to point out is the wrath of God is among us now. That God... God has wrath because he doesn't like things broken and messed up that he created good. So he gets angry. And his wrath takes two forms, passive and active. Here is his passive wrath. When we say passive, anyone have any idea what it might mean that God has passive wrath? He allows us to self-destruct, right? So God allows mankind to self-destruct. So some people are like, well, I'm doing all this. God must not lie because he hasn't stepped in. You're like, actually, the Bible says it's this passive wrath, that you are going under, that you are self-imploding, and he's not stopping you, is indication of his wrath against you. Now, passive wrath always results in, Romans 2 and 5, active wrath. Do you mean that God will ultimately follow passive wrath with active wrath, with passively allowing people to self-destruct, the nation to self-destruct, only then to come in and clobber them? Tell you, you might be in the wrong classroom because that's what this one's at, right? And you might be like, that is not what I've done. We live in a day where it's like, wait a minute, I like the like really light and fluffy Christian stuff. Can we avoid all the difficult stuff? Good Christianity should sound like a Hallmark card. If it doesn't sound like a Hallmark card, we're probably in the wrong place, right? You're like, no, 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 read this thing. Like, don't believe me, read this thing, right? Just read it tomorrow and by Tuesday, read it again and read it again and read it again. In fact, as long as it's still called today, read this thing and listen to it. And don't believe that I get it right, read it, all right? It's just saying this stuff, all right? So, like, I didn't create it. I'm just the mailman delivering you the mail. And, uh, heck, there you go. And, by the way, which is good these days, because the government sends us money for having kids. Go figure. Retarded on you, but whatever. You know what? Heck, we cashed it yesterday, so, hey. <laughs> just saying. So, I'm like the mailman. I'm bringing you good stuff. Uh, you can debate whether that's good or not. But I'm bringing you good stuff, all right? I, I, didn't, I didn't create any of this stuff. Uh, so here you go. He says, God gave them over to lust of their hearts to impurity, so their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passion, for women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Do you know where people go after they suppress truth? You know their favorite idol is sex. Not just true in America. This isn't just a prophetic message to America. It was a prophetic message to Rome. It's a prophetic message to America. It's a prophetic message to every nation. When you suppress the truth and unrighteousness, men's first inclination is to run to sex. But do you know this is the only mention here, verse 26, of lesbianism in the Bible? The reality is, by the time you get to the point where women have given way to this type of evil, you're in a big mess. Men, 
are more corrupt. You find gay throughout, all the way back to Genesis. You find men in wickedness in this form, all the way back to Genesis. This is the only mention of women doing it. When a culture gets so bad off that women turn to lesbianism, the Bible says things have really got to be a mess, right? You say, that offends me. Yeah, but you're wrong. So, there you go. Like I said, hey, this is, uh, you came here like on the wrong day. Aren't you glad you didn't bring your friends today? Like, you still have friends. You still have friends, right? Next time, it was much better. You can bring friends next week and still have a friend when we get done. It'll be great. So, uh, this was a good week. Not This is like the week, don't bring a friend week to church. We have a few of those around here. And, and I didn't create this, I'm just reading this, so if you get offended, just go read it yourself. But, uh, he gave them over to the great passion. Women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. Wow. But doesn't our culture accept that you were born gay? Isn't that the basis and premise for making homosexuality a civil rights issue? And yet the God who created mankind says, I didn't make it that way? So then you have to decide, well, who's telling me the truth? Is it God? Or is it the courts? Is it culture? And most people, the courts, the culture, everyone goes, I read this, I don't disagree with it, therefore I'm right. Christianity, actually Christianity, you start to do that too, but Christianity says, I read this, I believe differently, I'm wrong, I repented, and I believe what he said. That's Christianity. I know it's a bit of modern Christianity, but that is Christianity, all right? Uh, so he says, and in the same way also men abandon the natural function of the woman and burn in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own person due penalty of their error. So he says homosexuality, gay, all these things are not natural. They go against they go against everything that God has done to create this world. And so you know, this is super offensive, but uh, you know what guys? Idea is you have a baby, oh like we have a little baby Maverick. Oh, it's a boy. By the way, I know that's offensive. But it's a boy! We can tell! There's there's certain parts you can just tell. It's a boy! Give me the blue blanket, right? No, 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 I don't need a pink blanket, blue blanket. I know. This is super duper offensive. I probably can get blocked from Facebook for such offensive stuff. Give me the blue blanket. Oh man, this is so cool. Get him a little toy truck. Oh, this is so cool, right? He turns sticks into guns before he's one. Oh, he's a, he's a boy, right? When you grow up, you're gonna like girls. Like, that's pretty normal, pretty natural, even though in our culture, like, that's so wrong and backwards. Because when you lose truth, you suppress truth, you lose reality. So when Harris or Kirsten came on, ah, oh, beautiful, it's a girl. I knew that. There were things I knew, like, that's a girl. I know, it's hard to believe. I knew that. And get the pink blanket. Give me a dolly, right? Oh, it's a girl. She's going to like boys one day. She doesn't yet. Don't let anything go. She won't until she's 40. I don't know. Just so you know. It's a girl. She's beautiful. She's lovely. I'm going to give her all the. Here's flowers. Here's the. You know. God made things certain ways. And while that offends everybody, our Creator, it doesn't offend. You're going to have to pick. You're going to either offend the Creator or offend the world. And you know what? The world is charging a higher price every day for offending them. In fact, we're the last rebels, the last holdout of truth, and they're going to make you pay if you hold out. They want to conform you into the image of the world, and they're going to make you pay if you don't go. What I'm saying is you need to be in the Word of God. You need to put on the arm of God. You need to be feeding on the Word of God. You need to be tied to the reality of God and the true reality that comes from the Word of God. Otherwise, all this stuff starts to sound normal. Like, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. Oh, in fact, I don't want to take pressure, so I'll just go and be conformed to the mold of this world. You see, he gave them over. He gave them over. He took a passive role and allowed them to self-destruct. So when people say, well, God must not mind what I'm doing, he hasn't stopped me. If God doesn't step in the way of what you're doing, when you're self-destructing, it's because his wrath is towards you. And when we walk around the Calvin Mall, and everyone has the rainbow symbols, while we're all trying to pass out Jesus, talk to people about Jesus, we're not waiting for the wrath of God to come on our nation. The wrath of God is upon our nation. 
Even though those who buy into these things are not our enemies, they've been deceived by our enemies. So we reach out in love, compassion. We bring to them the truth of our Creator, the truth of the Gospel, and the truth of God's Word, so they can be set free and liberated, not from what they were created from, but set free and liberated to be what, who they were created to be in the first place. People who love and worship and follow and trust God. Hmm. And so he passed the wrath, he says in the same way, actually going on in verse 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, you know, you know anybody, you ever met anyone who did not see fit to acknowledge God? Like, I don't want to acknowledge God, I don't want to I'm just blocking out of my mind. Happens all the time. If you're, if you're trying to share your faith with you did it all, you run into these people all the time, right? They did not see fit to acknowledge God. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do these things which are not proper. Here, here's your steps, so if you want to become like Satan, here's your steps. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. You go, man, this is a horrible list, right? This sounds like Chicago. I can say it, I'm in Houston. <laughs> My brother lives in Chicago. The, the, the reality is, this sounds horrible. No, this just sounds like the news. This is just us. This is just our culture. This is God saying, that is wrong, backwards and bad. It starts with sexual perversion. It ends up in every form of wickedness that follows in the footsteps of Satan. And although they know the ordinances of God, those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but they give party approval to those who practice them. This is wired into their DNA is not only that there is a God, but they're going to get punished for these things. So what do they do? Hashtags and parades. They give party approval. That's what they do. Joan sent me something this week. It's really disheartening. This uh, choir of gay men whose whole goal it was since deleted off the clock. Facebook and social media, but their whole goal, we're going to convert your kids, they're going to think like us, they're going to believe like us, we're going to we're going to change their mind, they're going to think everything like we think, and you're like, that is their goal, right? That's Romans 1, to conform to the mold. You're going to have to work hard this week if you're not going to end up conform to the mold that this world is trying to conform you to. Before long, you lose touch with reality. The real reality is what God said. It's not what you think or feel, it's not what the mob thinks or feels. We live in a day where we don't really stop to think. We just rush headlong with the mob into every visit. We need to like stop and think. Like we're God's people. We have the truth from God, the word of God. We need to stop and think. We need to stop and think. And so we look at it and say, wait a minute. We live in a culture that God says, and, and this is really a uh, Whatever God does, Satan counterfeits. We have baptism, right? Baptism is what the gay would call coming out. We say, internally, I've switched. I'm believing God. I'm going to follow God. I'm rejecting my old way. The false baptism in the gay and lesbian community is I'm coming out. I have what? I have decided God made me wrong. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. God made me wrong. He should come and repent. I'm right. He should repent. I'm coming out. I'm acknowledging who I am. Inside, I'm a woman. I'm acknowledging that, right? That's what they're saying. It's they're coming out. It's just a demonic form of baptism, right? For us, we say, I, I'm making public statement that I was sinful, that I was a villain, and God saved me. Their coming out is... I'm a victim, God's a villain, he should come and repent to me. We do baptism, I'm repenting my sin towards God, I was a villain, he was the victim, I transgressed against him, and he forgave me and gave me new life, and I'm, I'm coming out, right? So it's a different message, it's a different gospel. If God made us male and female, and we reject and dismiss his authority, we can recreate our gender identity, remake sex and sexuality, and it's nothing more than idolatry. It's worship of a false god. It's worship of Satan. That becomes the altar. The other person becomes the priest. Satan is the recipient. 
receiving praise for our sexual perversion. And in reality, when we suppress the truth and turn in our unrighteousness to all of the things of this world, we're really turning to Satan as our father, and we're inviting him to be in charge of our destiny. That's what we're doing. When you suppress the truth and unrighteousness, turn away from it, embrace everything the world's saying, you turn away from God, you embrace Satan, you say, you are now my father, you are in charge of my destiny. That's worse than putting Charles Manson in your spare bedroom, right? It's not going to go well. Because this is the only reality. Whether you like it or don't like it, whatever you think or feel about it, it doesn't matter. This is the real reality. It's Jesus. And you know what? Jesus doesn't say all these things to be like shouting from heaven because he's angry. He actually showed up here, looked us in the eyes and said, I love you. I created you. Come follow me. I'm going to live among you and with you. I'm going to show you a perfect life. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to rise from the grave, and I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I've come to bring you truth. I've come to heal you. I've come to forgive you. I've come to remove all these things from you. So why is God building an airtight case? So that we turn to the gospel. So that we turn to the love of God, the one who made us, also loves us, right? He didn't come to condemn us, but to save us. Not to hurt us, but to heal us. Not to yell from heaven, but to look us in the eyes and invite us to come with them into the kingdom. So we need to stop suppressing truth and start trusting truth. We need to stop denying God and start worshiping God. We need to stop complaining at God and start thanking God. We need to stop seeing ourselves as victims and God is the villain, and start to see ourselves as a villain, and God is the victim. It's God that's the wrong by us, and not the other way around. Here's the thing. The only reason that villains like us now love Jesus and want to follow him and love truth is because God came to us, opened our eyes, and showed us that all of this is from him. This world is a gift from him. When we look around at creation, you see beauty, you see order. You see that God is involved in the details. You know how many flowers grow in my backyard? Amazing. Dude, if Cholan had been the creator, that'd be like one gray flower. Like, we'd be like, what in the world is this? You know what I mean? It's extravagant, the God that we love and serve, the God who rules this world. He is in the details. If you don't think so, stop and smell the roses, right? Look at the details of this world. Everything around screams at our, about our Creator. He goes on and on forever. He's eternal. He's powerful. He's limitless. That's what creation is telling us. And from there, it leads us to the, to the special revelation, the, the revealing of God's own mind to us through the Word of God and the person of Christ, so that we would flee to Him. And He doesn't say this because He's mean. He says He's going to be loving. He doesn't say this to condemn us. He says He's says this to save us. He doesn't say these things to hurt us, but to heal us. It's Jesus. And if you believe that, go tell everybody. You'll probably face much difficulty and hostility like Paul did, or Jesus did, or any of the 12 did, or any of the 70 did. This is a very unpopular message because it's exactly opposite of the gospel of this world. It's breaking the mold. It's the last rebellion. It's Christianity. It's following the one true and living God. That everyone one day will be, they have taken knee and they'll bow and they'll worship and they'll, in, in the sense of saying, you are what? Lord of the universe. Most it will be too late. They will be taking a knee simply out of force. For us, we've taken a knee out of love. We see him as our father. We love him because he first loved us. He's forgiven us. He's given us eternal life. We need to tell some folks, right? Because the people around us are not our enemies. They've been deceived by our enemies. And we need to know the truth because we live in a day where everyone wants to believe lies, even Christians, because we live in this Christianity life, and we don't even talk about difficult things on Sundays. It fits perfectly with why the whole Christianity is getting wiped out, too, by all of this foolishness. We need to understand the deep things of God. You do that tomorrow morning when you wake up, you pray, you ask God for insight, and you go and read the Bible, and you just keep doing that. You feed your soul on this every day, and God will meet with you. He will show you wonderful things from his law. He loves you. He's your Father, and he wants to speak to you. You need to know that. Let's pray. Father... Thank you for revealing ultimate truth so that we're not walking in darkness, but rather we're walking in light. And we want to bring this light to the people around us who are captured by the darkness, who are believing lies, who are no longer tethered to reality, even though they were born with a DNA that was wired to know that you exist and that you punish disobedience, and yet they've walked away, suppressed that. Lord, 
please help us understand if there are ways that we're suppressing truth currently that you would open our eyes and we'd repent of those things. We're sorry. We recognize we're the villains. You're the victim. Thank you that you forgive us even though we were your enemies and wronged you. Thank you for your love, grace, and forgiveness. Thank you for coming here and rescuing sinners like us. We praise you for this gospel message. We pray that you would help many, many people get saved and, 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 and that we get to see the baptized and grow and be disciples. Thank you. Just say our prayer. Amen. Thank you.